an excellent panel. Um, we have three scholars of different disciplines, so hopefully we're going to mix up the perspective a bit. Um, and so there'll be a bit of something for everyone from different policy environments, from a uh, rights perspective, from the economic arguments to um, more sociological, anthropological <coughs> arguments, and uh, the, the pure economist as well. So to my far left is Christian Koltz Ulrichsen, who joins us um, from Seattle, but he is a fellow at the Baker Institute at Rice University. Uh, he's a political economist by training. And Omar Abedli, who joins us from uh, Bahrain, and he's the program director for international and geopolitical studies at the Bahrain Center for Strategic International and Energy Studies, also known as Darasat, um, in Manama. And he's also an affiliated associate professor of economics um, at George Mason University. And to my right is Atiyah Ahmad, who is an assistant professor of anthropology uh, at George Washington University. So please join me in welcoming our panel to AGSIW. So the theme today is, uh, is, is labor market, labor dynamics in the Gulf. And to contextualize it a bit, what we've been talking about through the morning is that this is also a moment of reform across the GCC. This is a moment that's been necessitated by the decline in commodity prices, the decline in oil prices. So for the first time in uh, at least a decade, Gulf states are making different or pushed to make different kinds of changes in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of monetary policy, and also in terms of labor policy. And the economic development model of the Gulf, as we have known it since the 1960s, has been built on uh, foreign labor, migrant labor. Uh, and this has gone in flows, preference for certain kinds of uh, non-nationals in different <coughs> kinds of sectors to build economies, uh, literally from the ground up. Um, and this might be a moment for things to change. There's been a push for economic diversification away from oil within the GCC since long before oil prices have fallen. But right now we're seeing more interest from states in these kind of national transformation programs is what the Saudis are calling theirs. Um, but there's definitely what I would say is a, a reform moment happening. Um, so how does labor market reform fit into that? Um, I wanted to start with Christian Ulrichsen and ask him to give us kind of a bigger picture. Um, what are some of the challenges that are facing the GCC states? How are they different? I mean, there is a, a large amount of diversity within the GCC in terms of um, economic development and, and populations as well, in terms of the makeup of the populations among nationals and non-nationals. Um, so what's your perspective, Christian? Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, in terms of the impact, and again, as you said, it varies considerably. Obviously, Saudi Arabia with a population of 30 million, 21 million of whom are Saudi nationals, would be very different from Qatar, which is a population of 2.3 million, of whom roughly 250 to 350,000 are Qatari nationals. So again, it's interesting there that the f exact number is pretty sensitive and is not <coughs> necessarily publicly revealed. So you have different gradations of impact. But I guess the overarching theme is that a lot of the austerity measures that are being announced First of all, we'll have to see if they're really put in place. I think implementation will be the key to watch. But we are seeing, I think, a newfound willingness of governments to think the unthinkable, at least to say so, perhaps on, on paper, whether or not it's actually put into practice is different. But in that respect, I think the demographic imbalance, paradoxically, has been seen, obviously, as an issue of social unease among many Gulf nationals, but now actually gives Gulf governments and entities some considerable leeway mm. in actually being able to make quite substantial cuts without necessarily hitting the citizens where it hurts. So we've seen, obviously, the kind of... Um, reduction in force of expatriates, often being the first in the firing line when projects are scaled back or canceled and when government spending is downsized. And so that allows, I think, the governments a little bit of breathing space, kind of room for maneuver, 
while they perhaps might hope that the oil price at least stabilizes or potentially goes up to some extent. I mean, I don't think it will go up significantly. And looking back, perhaps we can say in hindsight that the, the region dodged a bullet in 2009 when oil prices collapsed from $145 a barrel to 35 but very quickly went back up to 60 or 70 and within two years we're back up over 100 We don't see that happening anytime soon. So I think the, as I think we were talking about in this morning, the, there's a moment now which can and has to be seized because the, the fiscal pressures that have been in the past perhaps dismissed as being always 10 years down the line are now not only immediate, but also unavoidable. And so I think that's changing the dynamic, at least in terms of the willingness of officials to, to think of measures that we might have been surprised to have seen, even taxation to some way. And even there with the kind of labor dynamic, states like Qatar and the UAE could very easily impose higher taxation levels, higher charges on the 80 or 90 percent of its population who are non-nationals to try to, again, cushion the blow perhaps and to maybe mitigate the damage or the kind of eating away at the social contract between the state and its citizens. Clearly, the majority of those non-nationals would be low-paid migrant laborers who wouldn't necessarily have the wherewithal to actually sub contribute substantially in terms of charges and fees. But again, pilot schemes perhaps could try to sensitize citizens in the Gulf to the notion <coughs> that you do begin to contribute in a more substantial way to kind of the, the kind of resources, the kind of the income of the state. So moving away perhaps from pure redistribution to a mixture of redistribu redistribution but also extraction of wealth. So perhaps rolling those measures out to non-nationals first could give that kind of time to sensitize people to the change. Again, it would be difficult to imagine they kind of go from zero to 100 in one go, but this sort of incremental step might be the way they will try to do it. Of course, the difficulty there perhaps is that they may not have the time. If uh, you know, the Saudis, for example, are running a budget deficit of $89 billion a year, which may or may not, well, probably doesn't include even military spending, which could be a, another 50 or 60. So, I mean, time is not necessarily on the side of the Gulf governments right now. It's interesting we've seen the position, the kind of putting in power of a whole new generation of younger leaders. And that's, again, something that I think is significant because I think at least as an awareness that things have to change, an awareness that young leaders can better connect with the aspirations, the understanding of what it's like to be a young person in the Gulf, perhaps a young national, for whom the old rules of the game perhaps don't necessarily mean the same as for the parents and grandparents' generation. So having people like Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia talk that kind of talk of being the kind of Thatcher <coughs> of Saudi Arabia not only plays to an external audience, but I think it tries to play domestically. And uh, from what I can understand, at least from talking to Saudis, he, you know, he resonates among young Saudis. At least they think that here's a young person in position of power who actually gets it. Because if you think that some of the issues behind the Arab uprisings in 2011 was because the, uh, there's perhaps a perception that ruling elites were getting older, populations were getting younger, and the kind of gap and mismatch between them is getting bigger. You know, I think there's now an acknowledgement among Gulf governments that they've got to really emphasize youth aspirations and try to understand them in a much better way as a corollary of taking these austerity measures to try to soften or at least blunt the impact that they'll necessarily have on, on that social contract, which will have to be, I think, quite heavily changed over the next few years. The difficulty, I think, is that nobody's really got a clear idea of how that will change and where it will end up. Because if you begin that whole taxation representation argument, then you run the risk of setting in motion a series of kind of changes that kind of go in different directions <coughs> than, than were anticipated. So 
I guess that's what I would say as a macro level. So the beginning of a journey of a process, but it's not clear where it's going to end up. Thanks. Let's, let's push a little further on that um, with you, Omar. I mean, questions of what potential reforms can look like. Um, and I know you have some, some views about increasing efficiency, increasing productivity within the public sector. That's a big issue. And all these demographic imbalances, a lot of what we hear about is uh, the large proportion of Gulf nationals who are employed in the public sector, um, but are they actually <coughs> growing economies this way. Um, and Christian touched also on the issue of youth, which I think is very important. What do we, well, how do we incentivize young people, especially well-educated young Gulf nationals, to join the workforce, be entrepreneurs, to be public sector employees, but to be able to effectively create change? Um, so give us the policy perspective, the, the economist perspective on, on potential reforms and uh, possibilities. <clears throat> so, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Young and to AGSIW for hosting this event and inviting me. Uh, just very briefly, I wanted to pick up on a point made by Christian, which is this idea that as an intermediate step, you could impose taxation on, on the foreign nationals. Um, <clears throat> and this is something which is supported heavily at the grassroots level in the GCC. You'll regularly speak to citizens and they'll say something like, before you remove our subsidies, you should remove subsidies from foreigners. Before you tax us, you should tax foreigners. Um, and while I'm not surprised that people have that attitude, I think that uh, they need to, there needs to be a modification in the way of thinking, and it's a modification which I hope policymakers uh, 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 take into account, which is that the decision to allow a significant labor pool, foreign labor pool into the GCC is a strategic decision based on perceptions of the interests of the GCC countries. It's not a humanitarian move, it's a, it's a move because... The, um, as uh, Karen mentioned, the foreign labor for many years has had and continues to this day to play a very important role in performing basic functions and critical functions in the GCC. So if you're going to affect, if you're going to tax them or subsidize them, this is not an issue of their rights as foreigners. This is an issue of economics first and foremost, which is that if you change the benefits they receive from being here, that's going to affect the, skill, qu the quality of the skills you get coming and the numbers you come. And therefore, you need to take that into account when you make a decision, rather than just saying something along the lines of, they're foreigners, so they're outside the franchise, we're citizens, we're inside the franchise, therefore we're taxing them and not taxing us, something. That's a very simplistic and fundamentally incorrect way of analyzing. It should be analyzing as these people have a strategic role in the economy. If we change their sl the slice of the pie they're getting, that's going to change their, their behavior. So we're going to take that into account before making a final decision. And now, going back to the question you raised in terms of the, the reforms, um, many of the distortions or many of the um, idiosyncrasies uh, uh, of, the, of the GCC labor market can be traced back to the fact that public sector salaries, first of all, that uh, nationals dominate the public sector um, in places like Qatar. I think it's almost like a, almost 100 percent of employed nationals are employed in the public sector. Um, and, uh, and in addition to having these jobs, they actually uh, um, uh, receive salaries which are completely incommensurate with any sort of reasonable uh, uh, measure of productivity. Um, now, this is not something, what the idea that uh, th determining public sector wages and salaries is something that's difficult, is a difficulty that's faced by every uh, economy, advanced or developing, for the simple reason that it's very difficult to measure productivity in administrative tasks such as you know, if you're going to work in an embassy or if you're going to work in a uh, ministry of labor or something. So it's not as if anyone has solved that problem, but that problem is contained um, to some degree in most other advanced economies by the fact that the public sector is small um, and their wages are benchmarked um, based on qualifications with what you'd find in the private sector. What you'll find in the GCC is that they're not benchmarked. They're, they're artificially high um, because ultimately because part they, they, they represent a mechanism for redistributing oil wealth to, to citizens. And while that was something that was financially sustainable in the, you know, in the early years of the GCC uh, economies post-independence, that's something which is creating a huge drag now because <coughs> as a result, so Karen mentioned that how do you motivate young people to you know, deploy their skills in a, in a productive way? How do they become entrepreneurs? 
well, you know, it, it may sound like tough love, but you need to take away the, al- the cushy alternative that they've had. Now, as Christian says, that cushy alternative may be organically disappearing now because of the pressure from oil prices and so on and so forth. So maybe you don't even have to make that much of an effort. But at the same time, you've still got a huge percentage of the population of the, empl- of the labor force, I should say, working jobs where they're fundamentally unproductive. Um, and uh, and uh, it would be a great boost for the private sector in the long run if you stopped the private sector from having to compete with a bloated and, and overgenerous public sector. But that doesn't mean that you're just, you know, taking these jobs away from people and then this money is vanishing into the ether. No, it's just being redistributed according to the mechanisms that we're used to seeing them, which is through the market process, through, uh, through, through uh, salaries tied to productive output, um, and hopefully in sectors where, where the uh, laborers can compete uh, in an open market, um, workers compete amongst themselves and companies compete for amongst themselves for the services of the workers and you end up with something like a healthy uh, a conventional labor market. So um, in answer to Karen's question, I would say that a key direction for reform would be um, restructuring the public sector so that it's much smaller, much more efficient and not tying um, and, and stopping wages from being um, or salaries being artificially high in the sector so that you can give people every incentive to acquire the qualifications and skills that the market actually demands, um, and at the same time, give individuals the incentive to, to work hard and to focus on uh, delivering a product or a service that is genuinely demanded by others rather than is bureaucratically mandated. One thing we haven't touched upon yet is, is uh, the issue of, um, of visas, of the kafala system and how foreign laborers are tied to employers within ac- across the GCC. But there have been differences and measures of reform tried across the Gulf states um, in order to create some efficiencies, right, to, to also to allow people to take their labor elsewhere if they're unhappy with their jobs, right? Um, I want to make sure we come back to that, but I, I'd like to go to Atia next and and talk more about um, I guess the bigger picture from a more societal perspective um, and what's going on, what's a potential for reform, but what are the potential ripple effects um, that might happen inside vulnerable communities, inside um, you know, different kinds of groups that, that are, are going to be dealing with, with these changes coming? First, I'd like to thank AGSIW for the invitation and the opportunity to be here, and to you all for being here. Um, As Karen intimated, um, I approached the question of labor migration, reform, so on and so forth in the Gulf from a somewhat different vantage point. And so I want to briefly comment how I approach these questions of migration, labor regimes in the Gulf, as it differs in significant ways from my colleagues. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and I'm interested in underlying socio-historical processes and cultural understandings and practices that undergird political and other realms. Now, an easy way to conceptualize this is to think of the totality of these realms as an iceberg. Most media and policy discussions bring into focus the tip of the iceberg. Anthropologists, however, we focus on the bulk of the iceberg, right? that remains underwater, so is often unnoticed, disregarded, or taken for granted phenomena that underlie, I would argue, undergird, and animate these other processes. So sometimes it may appear that our work is disconnected or irrelevant, but I assure you it is connected to the tip. Okay, so my own work is based on intensive ethnographic research that I conducted in Kuwait for almost two years, and also uh, research and uh, intensive ethnography in the UAE and Qatar for shorter periods of time. And the question I'm most interested in that's pertinent to us today are two groups of foreign residents or non-citizens or labor migrant groups, depending on the term you would like to use. Um, So one group are migrant domestic workers, Um, And then the other group are long-term foreign residents who've been in the region for several generations, consider it their de facto, if not de jure, home. Um, But for my comments now, um, I'm happy to revisit the question of um, non-citizen, long-term foreign residents, but I'm going to focus on the issue of migrant domestic workers. Okay, so first 
I would want to place the question of transnational labor migration in a broader global and historical context, right? One that pushes us to think of the region not in exceptional terms. So while the Gulf proportionately has more non-citizens than do other countries and regions of the world, that doesn't mean that there aren't similar dynamics and processes, right? And so it behooves us to look at this in a broader historical and geographical or global perspective to identify broader patterns, challenges, obstacles, and potential solutions to <coughs> challenges. Now, the kafala system, which is often focused on in the region and is often discussed in exceptional terms, is actually very resonant to sponsorship systems in many parts of the world, right? It, especially with respect to migrant domestic workers. And the broader questions that it raises is the importance of migrant laborers in our contemporary context, right, and the citizenship regimes, one that simultaneously manage, manages and excludes migrants that have developed in the wake, right, of these, um, these large-scale migration trajectories and processes. Now, the experiences of migrant domestic workers in the Gulf are usually examined in terms of their exploitation and abuse, and for good reason. There are, you know, cases of this that should not be disregarded. However, often the representations and depictions of these situations are filtered through or are articulated in terms of Islamophobic and Orientalist discourses. Right? Um, and what this obfuscates, to my mind, is how the situation of migrant domestic workers in the region is akin, right, there's striking resonances with those of migrant <laughs> domestic workers in other regions of the world in terms of patterns of treatment, exploitation, and abuse. And it pushes us to consider, I would argue, the gendered nature of national and transnational laws, right? And examining this question of the gendered nature of migration and the laws um, in the situation of the Gulf. So due to gendered historical processes, domestic work has largely fallen outside the wage labor market. Domestic work and domestic workers have also fallen outside the labor laws of most countries. Um, Kuwait, for example, their own labor laws are based on Egyptian labor laws, which in turn develop through legal systems that are based in, um, in, in the French context. Right? So there are longer historical and also geographical connections that we need to think about. And what both the, um, the issue of how certain gendered labor falls outside is not recognized, not uh, legible in terms of wage labor markets, and then how they fall also outside of labor laws points to there being these gendered political and legal aporias, right? And as a result of this, right, domestic workers who are situated at this nexus, they're often in very precarious juridical and political positions. Now this is shifting somewhat in parts of the Gulf. Uh, most notably in Kuwait, where in last year um, there was the passing of a domestic work law and we have yet to see, right, what the impacts of this will be, right, what, whether this will have a positive impact on the situation of migrant domestic workers in the region. And I raise that as a question um, largely because there have been reform attempts in the past, right? Um, the Kuwaiti uh, government passed uh, a law previously mandating the implementation of trilingual labor contracts. They've also stipulate, stipulated limits to the hours and days of work of domestic workers. They've also stipulated holiday times. Um, before, although migrant domestic workers did not fall under labor laws, they could seek recourse through criminal and civil laws. And research that has been done in Kuwait has pointed to how domestic workers who did present their situ their their um, um, their problems to, uh, to the judiciary that often they were found, uh, the courts found in favor of their petitions and their cases, yet at the same time few have had access to the court system. And there we've got questions of you know, their knowledge of, their familiarity of legal systems, questions of language and access and logistical problems. So what these past reforms then raise in terms of questions is whether the implementation of this new labor law, right, will be effective, um, given that there have been reforms in the past, right? Um, and their efficacy is definitely a question to be examined. 
Now, if we examine the situation of migrant domestic workers with respect to the questions of the nationalization of labor forces um, in the face of recent events, including question, you know, uh, processes of austerity, nationalization, it also raises some important questions um, in terms of underlying social dynamics and processes in the region. So migrant domestic workers constitute an, constitute an extremely high percentage of non-citizenry particularly in Kuwait, where there are over 600,000 migrant domestic workers, right? They're estimated to be about one-sixth of the total population. Now, in the face of austerity, in the face of processes of nationalization, I think the question needs to be asked whether this is a sector that will be nationalized, right? Will, uh, are nationals interested or will they be willing to pursue the undertaking of this work? Um, it also pushes us to consider the class or occupational dimensions, right, as well as the gender dimensions of these processes of nationalization. Um, now, it might just be that uh, due to austerity, right, um, and the declining incomes, there may be citizen families who can no longer hire domestic workers. And that raises broader questions, right, about um, changes into everyday life in Kuwait and other Gulf countries, the everyday functioning of the societies and the sorts of changes that would res uh, ensue. Um, so m the presence of migrant domestic workers is crucial to the everyday operation of households and the everyday functioning of societies in the Gulf, right? They are tasked with feeding and caring for the population, for the raising of children, the care of the elderly. They also, their work enables social visiting and cultures of hospitality that are really important to social, economic, and political networks and dynamics in the region. If we reduce the number of migrant domestic workers or if, if the number of them reduces, um, what are the implications in terms of the gender divisions of labor that exist within the region, right? Will this labor fall to women? Will it fall to children? How will this then affect or impact their involvement in the educational sectors, in the former labor market? Um, will this necessitate the state or the private sector to make available new resources, for example, child care centers? <coughs> and then how will this change patterns of social visitation, the function of, functioning of diwania, uh, children's involvement in schools, the ability to travel, and other dynamics and other aspects of everyday life in the Gulf? So just a few questions to broader social and historical questions to consider. Thank you for that. You're widening our, our dialogue. I, I really appreciate it. I think what we're uncovering, though, is a number of tensions that are coming under a reform agenda but really are playing at some longstanding issues. So um, nationalization, of course, are the efforts by states to get more nationals into the private sector um, and to decrease what is seen as dependence on foreign labor. And we see a lot of kind of cultural pushback on um, fear of, uh, you know, is our identity being lost or what is our identity, right? You see that in, in conversations in the Gulf a lot. Um, and this plays on, I think, state society relationships. What is the commitment both to the state to citizen and what does citizen ask in turn from the state? Um, diversification efforts are more about, you know, growing economies that are not just oil economies, of course. Um, and what about rights efforts? So this falls in line with, you know, also bigger state building processes that try to integrate into global norms. Um, and the Gulf states have been treaties or uh, signatories to many different protocols and treaties um, with varying degrees of implementation and effects. And so this moment is kind of, I think, pulling all of these issues together. Um, and as Christian, I think, mentioned, either this morning or just now, is, is time not on our side? Um, so what is realistic in terms of change? Um, how much time do states have? What would, what would be realistic kind of reform measures now? Christian or Omar, or anybody want to jump in on that one? I mean, it's very difficult to pinpoint one measure that could be applied to all six states because they're so different. I mean, we talk about training and education of youth. That's already been done in many ways. I mean, this new generation of Gulf youth are incomparably better trained than any previous generation has. You have, for example, the King Abdullah scholars going back to Saudi Arabia, and there are tens of thousands 
The difficulty being that often they don't find sufficiently challenging positions within within Saudi Arabia that they want to do. So you know, we've had, I think, half of the solution, which is training and kind of education. It's the kind of mismatch or alignment, kind of the misalignment of expectation that is the is the key. Um, it's not clear to me how stripping away public sectors will necessarily, I mean, it may be an economic measure, but it will, may cause political ramifications if we take the view that public sector employment is in many ways a critical part of that wealth transfer from the state to its citizenry. So I think governments will have to think very carefully about what to replace that with and how to replace it and whether to do it in the stages. I think that clearly the leaderships have grasped things have got to change, but I just don't necessarily see there's a unifying vision on how to get from A to B. I think we've seen in the past economic measures that have been mooted and that have been scaled back at the first sign of political sort of disquiet, discontent. I'm thinking perhaps of the Bahraini labor market um, regulatory authority in late 2000s trying to increase the fees on expatriate laborers. <coughs> which were then suspended in 2011 and then reintroduced at lower levels in 2013, or the Nittakart proposals in Saudi Arabia, which caused a lot of backlash among business elites and uh, led to quite hostile questioning among members of the Shura Council of the government. And I think especially over the last five years, the kind of broader regional upheaval, which we now see so strongly, the Gulf involved so heavily in Yemen and Syria, Governments will not necessarily want to take politically sensitive measures at a time of such regional uncertainty when the instinctive response in the past has been perhaps to do the exact opposite and to escalate the politics of patronage. So given that that's no longer really available as a short-term mechanism, it's almost like the perfect storm in many ways, which one would imagine the best case scenario would be that everybody in the Gulf, rulers and citizens alike, finally grasp that the situation now has to change. And that gives everybody that measure of political courage to push things through and not to kind of balk at the first sign of any sort of pushback. But it would be interesting to see if that happens if oil prices remain at this level for one or two more years. <coughs> yeah, just on the issue of uh, reforms for migrant workers, <clears throat> so I think that, as, as you correctly alluded, there's there's a need for significant reforms, and this is something we discussed in the in the preceding session. There's a need for significant reforms uh, to uh, protect um, worker rights in a way that benefits all parties. Um, it's uh, there's no there's no labour market. Um, or should I say, a clean and, and healthy labour market is something that serves the, the the interests of every stakeholder in the labour market. Um, but I think there's a, a, an, an underemphasis of the role that um, uh, the sending countries have in improving the uh, uh, conditions in the labor markets in the GCC. Uh, to give an example, <coughs> or to be specific, I should say, um, uh, no matter how, uh, uh, how, um, um, how should we say, protective or how um, um, uh, humanitarian the GCC countries um, decide to be, um, there's only so much they can do about racketeering in uh, in descending countries. Uh, if if there are people who are willing to go into poor villages where people are uneducated and to uh, <coughs> trap people in in, in debt and uh, and to uh, deliver false uh, deliver them false promises about what they will have when they arrive in a GCC country, then an important part in in defeating that is a partnership with descending countries themselves. And there's a if you look at the case of the Philippines, um, uh, they've actually had significant success. I'm not going to pretend as if they've solved all their problems, but Philippines, first of all, is a poor country by any by any uh, definition uh, of, of, of the word. They ranked very low in per, per capita income. Um, they took a decision, I think sometime in the 70s, to use migrant labor as, as a significant uh, component of their economy, uh, and they rely on remittances to a huge degree. Um, <coughs> and they've decided to um, uh, to regulate their labor market, their migrant workers, um, in, in a commendable way. 
um, at least by international standards. And, and they've realized significant returns in terms of protecting their workers and in a way that serves the interests of the countries that receive them as well. Um, it's not in the long-term interest of any country to have p undocumented, uh, uh, undocumented migrant workers who are unprotected legally and unaccountable legally, who are trapped in debt and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to say the Philippines has solved these problems, but has come up with a, has presented a template um, for, uh, for, for de decreasing the incidence of these kind of things. And I think it's something which, despite the fact that it's a poor country, and I think it's something which should be part of any effort to reform the labor markets in the GCC. There should be much closer cooperation between the GCC and the sending countries in terms of encouraging them to adopt something like the Philippines has done and... Uh, and that's something which also international organizations uh, may wish to uh, explore themselves, because I think that um, uh, it's a great it's a, it's a great template for how how to you know protect people's rights in a in a in a in in, in a way that serves everybody's interest. I wanted to go back to the question of um, looking at Gulf societies as as full societies of nationals and non-nationals together, so the long-term non-national resident. Yeah. Um, and, and so what role are these people playing in, um, in building a, a sense of um, national purpose, right, of, of kind of weathering the storm, but also building something, an economic development plan for the long term? So that's one kind of uh, area of investigation. I also think it's worth, um, as, as Omar notes, it's worth considering policy recommendations and policy inactions that have, have are, are working in terms of from the sending country, but also in the receiving country. So there, there are mechanisms to deal with crisis situations. So without overturning the kafala system, there are ways to create shelters, create um, uh, you know, legal processes where people can complain about their treatment. Um, but it doesn't really shift that notion of belonging, right? <clears throat> Am I here? Can I stay? Um, what are my options? So, Atia, maybe you could talk a little bit about those tensions, the belonging tensions. And then I promise we'll get to Q&A and we'll save a good 30 minutes for that. So give us five more minutes with the panel. Okay, so we discussed this briefly earlier um, this morning, uh, that in general, discussion about non-citizens in the region often focuses on, uh, if I may, elite expats and then um, often abjected or marginal uh, labor migrants, right? Uh, so there's definitely a strong class dimension in terms of our representation and our analyses of non-citizens. What's often disregarded in these accounts are a large population of middle class foreign residents, non-citizens, de jure, but who feel the Gulf and enact ways in which the Gulf is home to them. So de facto, they feel they are citizens. Um, and they have been involved historically in the Gulf uh, through transnational merchant networks, uh, familial networks, right? So I think, again, pushing us to kind of think about these dynamics in terms of longer historical patterns and processes helps us to think through, right, our own understandings of citizenship and who gets included and who gets excluded in terms of formal regimes of citizenship in the region. Um, it also helps us um, to think about other ways in which these groups, a significant presence in terms of numbers and also in terms of the activities, right? Um, Neha Vora has written a marvelous book called Impossible Citizens, where she documents, right, that as, as soon as you land in Dubai and you get into a taxi cab, you're often driven by a foreign resident who is of South Asian background, will often eat in restaurants that are owned and operated from foreign residents who are from the Shem region or from South Asia. So their presence is there. Um, and their activities and their importance to the region, I think, are well substantiated. Um, what seems to be lacking is analyses and accounts of their presence, activities, and importance in the region. Um, so again, pushing us to think about kind of broader historical and social and cultural processes will help us to begin to account for what are often disregarded issues and populations. <coughs> Thank you. All right, so as promised, unless one of our panel members wants to interject again, I'm, uh, no, we're okay? All right.
So we'd be happy to take questions to broaden the conversation. We do have a number of people who were with us this morning, um, a lot of experts in the room, so to speak, so we'll I'll let them jump in too if they want. Um, there are a couple of microphones, so just raise your hand if you have something you'd like to ask, comment, or uh, question. Nobody? Siggy, please. <laughs> Sigurd Neubauer, and I'm a non-resident fellow here at the Institute. <coughs> Excuse my voice. Um, my question is a little bit about the, diff the various tiers of foreign migrants um, in, in the Gulf region. So um, between those who do domestic service kind of jobs to um, those who are employed by the security services, you know, since, uh, since Omar is from Bahrain, they have a, Bahrain has a large uh, Pakistani contingency in uh, the security services. Uh, so I was wondering perhaps if the panel could talk a little bit about um, these different segments and what are some of the tensions um, regarding, let's say, policing on one hand, and to, to ensuring that uh, perhaps those who are m the most vulnerable among the migrants, um, what kind of tensions exist between them versus, let's say, other migrants that are from, are, are there differences if you come from, let's say, Nepal to, from, to Pakistan, or let's say that you come from um, the Philippines? So if you could uh, uh, touch on these uh, topics, um, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to return to the issue of kind of the gendered nature of many of these processes. Um, Omar very, um, I think, lucidly and um, uh, comprehensively uh, pointed to the role or the potential role that labor sending countries can play. Um, but again, the role that they play is also gendered. Right. Um, so at the same time that the Philippines government um, has implemented a series of policies and changes and um, sort of institutional mechanisms to provide migrant domestic workers with recourse in the face of difficulties, conflicts, and problems, um, in the past, and uh, I don't know whether this is the case today, and perhaps our colleague uh, from HRW can me out here. Um, but in the past and with other labor sending countries, the response to difficulties and conflicts and issues of abuse and exploitation that migrant domestic workers have experienced has resulted in blanket or partial labor migration bans, which have not stemmed the migration of these women to the region. Often they will then circumvent these bans by traveling through third countries and enter into the Gulf and find their situation even more precarious. Um, so again, I would push in thinking about you know, different population segments of, foreign, res of uh, foreign residents and migrant workers and thinking about the tensions, the difficulties, and the policing they experience, I would urge us all to think about these in gender terms because it really elucidates you know, processes um, that are complicated and seemingly contradictory at the same time. So uh, my question is uh, about reforms in receiving countries. So one example I'm familiar with is in 2013, Bahrain passed a very beautiful, amazing um, labor law that gave a lot of rights to um, workers, things like collective bargaining, um, complaints, uh, processes that really benefited workers. But then if you read the whole law and then there's like a little exception, like a little line at the end saying this law does not include domestic workers, um, drivers, and construction workers. So, so it seems that there's a systematic trend of new laws, um, uh, labor reform laws, but they, you know, this significant segment of the labor market is not being included. So how do you sort of think about that on the long term? And then the question of political will, as you mentioned, um, I think that um, is definitely an important dimension. You want to take that one? <coughs> so with a lot of these uh, r segmented rules or uh, <coughs> discriminating rules, I think that um, the reality is no matter how um, discriminatory or, or un uh, undesirable they may, may be towards a certain segment, the reality is that despite that, uh, people who are aware of those rules continue to want to come and operate under those conditions. Um, and that's an opportunity which, the, which is quite unique to the GCC in that other countries do not make it so easy for people to come and work as domestic workers, construction workers, or whatever. 
Uh, and the reality is, and if you judge by the migration flows, um, that even under these inferior conditions, they'd still rather come and work under these inferior conditions rather than not have the opportunity to come at all. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't abuses, <coughs> in fact, there are regular abuses, but the, um, uh, as the, the, what we should be bef before, in my opinion, rather than before, before the step of tackling, trying to reach for some homogenous rule, there should be an attempt to, um, by bo authorities on both sides, the sending country and the receiving country, to stop situations where people do not realize what they're signing up for, so to speak, because that's something that doesn't serve any size interest. Um, I bet that if America decided to apply discriminating rules which made it for certain sectors but opened the doors, there'd be millions of people lining up to come in under those conditions and they'd be quite happy because it would give them a way to increase the incomes of for themselves and their families and back in their home country. Um, so, and if you force the GCC countries to harmonize, uh, especially given how important, for example, foreign labor is to domestic work and to uh, construction, all you'll do is you'll artificially uh, uh, damage, you'll in, in indirectly artificially damage the groups that come and work in the countries under those conditions because basically what will happen is they'll say, fine, we're not going to deal with foreign workers and that, we're going to look for some alternative, or you'll create a black market um, whereby, and just as uh, Atiyah mentioned, they, if you try and restrict one country, then they'll go in through the back door um, and, and they'll try and circumvent the rules because the economic pressure is there to, to, to have them in that inferior class. So I think that um, uh, the emphasis before looking for some sort of universal uh, harmonized rules should be on ensuring that people have whatever rights people are allocated, they're aware of, and those rights are enforced. I mean, to some extent, I mean, there already has been the Abu Dhabi Dialogue and the Global Forum for Migration and Development, I think, that Qatar and the UAE have to some extent participated in to try and at least raise some of these issues, although I guess the, the key, as the question was very much pointing out, is about implementation and ensuring that implementation is consistent and all-encompassing. And, you know, obviously the Abu Dhabi dialogue is a dialogue at best. It's not a, it's not a kind of um, a group with any necessarily any kind of implementing sort of framework to do so. So one gets a sense that the Gulf states are recognizing the need to have a better framework for negotiation or at least dialogue with sending states, um, whether or not that's to kind of head off some of the international criticisms or it's because of a more deep-rooted willingness to try to alleviate some of the conditions is, is probably up to up to kind of someone to guess, to kind of balance where that lies. But I mean, there have been, I guess, initiatives. I guess one other issue that has, I think Atiyah mentioned, kind of alluded to is the issue of undocumented workers. And that's a big issue. In Saudi Arabia, there were several hundred thousand undocumented workers, large numbers in the UAE as well. And there's evidence that you have kind of is in the UAE as well, I think, kind of unofficial pension schemes, things like that, insurance kind of working kind of very unofficially among um, migrant communities who are basically operating as kind of almost statelets within the state, creating their self-help networks among themselves which is uh, you know, something that perhaps operates well beneath the veneer of state kind of overseeing and supervision, but is very much a kind of defensive mechanism for the communities in the absence of any kind of formal assistance perhaps from the state or from maybe their representatives from the embassies that they come from. I'm Farah Naqib. I'm an assistant professor of history at the American University of Kuwait, and I'm a visiting uh, scholar at AU here this semester. Um, I wanted to thank you all also for a great panel. And I wanted to pick up something, Amr, that you had mentioned that I think is really important. And you talked about in the context of the idea of taxation for uh, non non citizens and you know, or reducing the benefits or access to benefits to non citizens. And you made the argument that I agree with completely, which is that we need to, you know. Part of the, this idea of labor reform needs to encompass a, considering non-citizens as a strategic and fundamental part of the economy and improving their their quality of life and so on, and in order to make them more, you know, feel more um, having stronger interests. And I think that's certainly very important. I mean, even when you think of things like remittances and and how much 
money within the economy is going out and whereas if we gave um, non-citizens more of a financial stake, being able to own land, being able to own businesses, uh, and making them you know, a, a real strong part of the, the local economy. But I think when we talk about bringing in these kinds of economic reforms or labor reforms, these, I mean, I think it goes much deeper. I'm a social and cultural historian. I work in the bulk of that iceberg with, with Atiyah. Um, all of these things require a fundamental shift in the way we think in the Gulf at a social and cultural level. Before we can even, I think, begin to think about these kinds of economic reforms, the whole concept of citizenship and, and the way we think about citizenship in the Gulf is one of those things that would require major transformation first before we can even start to think about these. Because um, you know, the whole concept of citizenship in the Gulf is based on, fundamentally based on exclusion. They're very ex the, the laws themselves are both exclusive and exclusionary. They're based on, the concept of citizenship in the Gulf is very much based on the exclusion of, of, of the majority of the population who are outsiders. I mean, that brings into play all of these other, the gender dynamics, that, you know, how, uh, the everyday li level. Um, reform in education, I think, you know, bef again, all of this requires a major transformation in the way we think about citizens, non-citizens, the question of belonging. Of course, in the Gulf, non-citizens are considered guests or transient workers, whereas Althea's research, you also show that, you know, we have two, third, second, third generation. So I'm just wondering the extent to which we can stop talk about or think about these economic reforms without going that into that much deeper level of where the reform really needs to come in first, I think, you know, as, as somebody living every day in the Gulf before we can start to reach that other level. I think that's an excellent point. It, it did come up a, a good bit this morning and ways that governments might reach out to citizen and non-citizen populations to say, hey, we're, we're in this together, right? We're gonna go through a tough patch. Here's what we can do. Um, I used the example this morning that I recently learned about in Bahrain, the social media effort to um, uh, encourage people to pay workers on time, right? Small thing, but it's interesting in that their target was uh, young people, young nationals, to be proud of doing the right thing. Right? And that's, I think, kind of what you're getting at, right? But those changes take a long time. So I think you've, you've posed a very important question. Do we have that time? Because changes are necessary, but there's a larger conversation at stake as well. Um, anyone else want to pose a question here in the front? Sarah? Um, yeah. One aspect oh, say your name, and here's sorry, the mic coming. Uh, Sarah Lee Whitson, Human Rights Watch. Um, one aspect that I find very interesting that is a little bit outside of the field of the area that Human Rights Watch focuses on, but I find you know sociologically, politically, economically so interesting, is the extent to which talking about rights of uh, migrant workers in the Gulf actually opens up a whole other can of worms, which I think Christian touched on, which is rights for the native population, the citizen population, which are glaringly absent. And so when we talk about, well, if we tax migrant workers, uh, there's issues of taxation without representation. Well, there's issues of taxation without representation if you tax the citizens of the UAE or the citizens of Saudi Arabia and so forth. When you talk about uh, uh, basic labor protections, international conventions on labor rights, such as the right to form unions, the right to bargain collectively, the basic right to go on strike, uh, these expose not only the absence of these rights for the migrant workers, but glaringly illustrate the absence of these basic rights for uh, uh, Emirati workers or Saudi workers and so forth. I mean, fortunately, there's some union protections in Bahrain. Um, and the whole notion of the absence of citizenship rights uh, for migrant workers opens up a can of worms, which I think the Gulf has still failed uh, to grapple with, um, which is citizenship rights, representation rights for its own citizen population. And I wonder how much of the thinking um, uh, links these two together politically. So just as a, uh, a quick clarification uh, on, on this issue of uh, taxation without representation for migrant workers, for me, the, the reason I'm against sort of just si simply you know, removing subsidies from foreigners or taxing foreigners is not so much a, the moral issue of representation, it's more just the straightforward economics of this is part of their wage. So if you're, take, if you're, if you're decreasing their purchasing power, they're gonna reassess their decision um, to stay, uh, and, you might, and you're probably gonna lose people from the highest part of the quality ladder, and this is something which is important from an economics perspective. I'm not denying the things you're discussing, but they're, 
but they're, they're complementary to, 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 to the main point that I was raising. I am, you also mentioned this idea of uh, stop, uh, taxing transfers. I mean, uh, that's been suggested. Obviously, you're not suggesting it. I think it's a terrible idea that, uh, that, that's being thrown around, the idea you'd stop people from transferring money out, and people even describing this as a drain on the economy. These are the, these are the wages and salaries that people earn. That e they've come to work, and they're free to do with their money what they will. And if they want to transfer it to another currency, that's something that should be entirely up to them. Uh, and it shouldn't be taxed, nor should it even be perceived uh, as them doing something which is damaging to the economy. Um, and I think that's something which uh, uh, people should not, is not a perception that either citizens or not citizens, not citizens should have, nor should it be a goal of government to somehow impede. You know, capital controls have never worked anyway. Um, uh, and there's no fine, if, if people will get around it and you're just, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So that's just the pure economics, but even setting that aside, you don't want to generate a reputation for being a country that arbitrarily imposes capital controls and stops people for who've left their home country to come and earn a living from then taking that. If, if you want them to spend more money domestically, then give them something that's worth spending their money on domestically. Don't, don't you know, don't, uh, I'm sure, I mean, when I went to Dubai, I saw a lot of migrant workers um, who are probably working modest jobs, going to the mall and having meals in the restaurant. Um, uh, and so, you know, presumably because the restaurants are nice and they had a good enough income. Maybe if they don't do that in another country, it's because the restaurants aren't worth it. Um, uh, and, and that's entirely up to them. But you shouldn't address that through forcing, dying people's hands. I'm completely against that. And hopefully that will be uh, removed as a policy option. Uh, but going back to the issue of to what extent uh, cultural change needs to uh, it needs to be a progenitor for the, I think that, you know, this is my bias, I guess, as an economist, I think economic incentives bulldoze the cultural side. If you just, uh, um, uh, people will change their culture quite quickly once they hold their feet to the fire um, economically. Uh, and so um, I don't think culture is anywhere near as uh, 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 slow to change, um, and especially in the Gulf, because you see the flip side. People weren't as, uh, uh, as how shall we say, I'll put it euphemistically, uh, didn't enjoy life as much as they do now in 30, 40 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, they were working hard. They were, um, you know, were not complaining about the things they complain about now and so on and so forth. And that changed very rapidly. Now, obviously, one direction of change is easier than the other. But people change. You know, we all, in America, everyone likes to complain about millennials. But millennials, you know, they change. They, they, they face incentives just like everybody else. And they'll, they'll settle for the jobs. And, 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 and I think that will dominate. I think the question is really not will citizens change, what will people change, but can governments change, right? Um, but Christian, you had something to add. Maybe just to pull together Sarah and Farah's points about citizenship, which of course you're right, the whole notion of what it means to be a citizen is quite different in the Gulf than it is perhaps elsewhere. In a sense, it might be more of a conceived as a privilege rather than a right. And we've seen, you know, with withdrawal of citizenships in a number of Gulf states, that kind of sharpening of what it means to be a citizen, that kind of uh, kind of feeling that it could be a, you know, it could be taken away if you're not kind of perceived to be as loyal and as loyal to a system of individuals, not necessarily institutions. So I mean, that's one issue. And as you said, Fada, I mean, the whole issue of exclusion, of course, one issue is that it's, there are, and it's kind of maybe you would agree with this, there are economic incentives of citizenship, strong economic incentives of being a citizen in all the Gulf states through all the kind of benefits of you know, being a citizen. So that obviously reduces the incentive to expand that pool of citizenship. Now, if we enter a prolonged period of austerity and the economic benefits of being a citizen begin to reduce, I wonder if that might change the kind of calculus in some way. I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing that out. But if it, if it becomes less beneficial economically to be a citizen, might there be some willingness then to to try to reconceptualize. I, I'm just throwing it out. Oh, we've got two more questions uh, on both sides in the back. Josh Yaffe from the State Department. And I want to thank Christian for bringing up the issues of the, the various international forms that exist for labor debates. You have labor exporting and labor importing countries. The UN has a forum. The Abu Dhabi Dialogue is another. The Arab League has its own meeting of ministers of labor, and the GC has its meetings of ministers of labor. Um, on all of these discussions, uh, it's hard to see what, what is produced, what is the outcome of these, of these dialogues. And uh, my question to you then is, is that because the South Asian states, the labor exporting states, Central Asian states, 
don't have bargaining power? Is the market so inelastic that they are competing against each other and they have no leverage collectively? Uh, a country like Indonesia can cut off labor exporting for a year or two years, and the Gulf states don't have to care? Um, or is there another reason? Is there, is there something inherent in these processes that could be fixed that could result in more productive uh, results? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Matar Matar, former MP from Bahrain. Uh, I want to emphasize about the question about uh, the migrant worker who work in uh, uh, the military and uh, uh, and security jobs. Um, I do believe that they are facing uh, a typical cycle of human trafficking. Uh, a lot of them, they come to Bahrain, for example, and they are not interested to be a part of the repression process but they are forced to take this job. Um, some of them, for example, they come to join uh, the National Guards, but the government then will move them to, to be a, a in the front line of the conflict. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the protesters are expressing their frustrations to those migrant workers. So most of those who were killed uh, from the police were migrant workers. And when it comes to the government, if they are getting any pressure for accountability, they are bringing those migrants to, to take them accountable about uh, the, the uh, uh, excessive force, for example, uh, which makes them in, 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 in a cycle, which they don't like it, but they are trapped in it. Um, again, I, I, another issue I just want to ask uh, Christian regarding um, the issue of uh, the lack of a trust in, uh, in the economic reform and the labor market reform programs. Uh, I think it's important to have an inclusive process where people will get the trust in this process and participate. From your opinion, what is the least uh, political reform uh, to have kind of an inclusive process that encourage the people to be part and to support such kind of uh, labor market reform program. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bailey Palmer from the State Department. And I just wanted to go back to Itia's point about um, if migrant domestic, the large amount of migrant domestic workers becomes unsustainable, where that labor, where that labor will fall. Um, I've spent some time in the Gulf and it seems really unlikely that it will go to native w women or national women. So how will that, if, if it falls back on the households themselves, how will that affect um, women's calculus in joining the labor force? Even if the fora don't have tangible results that, you, that, that one might like them to have, the reality is that remittances are a far more effective form of foreign aid than direct foreign aid. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so even if these fora don't lead to substantive changes, um, it's still the case that the arrangement, judging by the labor flows that regularly occur, is a preferable alternative to, for example, just saying, no, we're not going to have any migrants coming in. We're just going to close the doors and say, all you construction workers and domestic workers and so on, stay in your own country. You're not allowed to come out. Uh, that's not to say that the, there isn't room for improvement. There's huge room for improvement. But there needs to be an acknowledgement that the existing setup, with all its, um, uh, with all its disadvantages, is still a far more effective way, in my opinion, of inducing development in the sending countries than giving them foreign aid or, or, or just ignoring them completely, which is what tends to happen with many other countries <coughs> when they deal with uh, the potentially exports of unskilled labor. Uh, directed at Christian from Matar Matar. Yeah, Matar, you make a very good point about the kind of politics of it, and I guess the conundrum, the dilemma perhaps for policymakers is that the two most participatory Gulf states, Kuwait and Bahrain, the dominant framework of politics is very much populism because you have individual politicians kind of playing to their constituencies to try to portray themselves as standing up for their constituents against government attempts to impose uh, 
fees, taxes, whatever you, whatever you, whatever you might have. And so that dynamic holds back kind of economic reform in many ways. We've seen that in a reaction now to the uh, attempts in Bahrain to kind of raise some of the prices. We see that in kind of politicians in Kuwait saying we're never going to stand for any form of increased price or reduction in subsidies. So that's a, dile a dilemma that they really face. Whereas, for example, in Qatar, they just announced 30% you know, price in gasoline uh, rise with eight hours notice, and it just went into effect. I mean, there's no kind of constraint, perhaps, on the executive there that you have in Bahrain and Kuwait. So that's a dilemma because, yes, by bringing people in in the form of participation in parliaments that have a real kind of not necessarily a say in decision-making, but a real power to affect the outcomes of policy-making, kind of the, the populist streak that runs so strongly through it currently is a kind of a break on on that kind of political capital that you're you're sort of thinking about. And that's, I think, the issue that's got to be thought through and perhaps resolved over the coming months and years. Do you want to weigh in on Bailey's question? Um, maybe just briefly some general comments based on the questions. Um, we've been asked here, I think, you know, to be experts, and I think also part of being experts is recognizing limitations in terms of studies or raising questions about further studies. And so uh, y your collective questions and responses there and um, raises a number of questions I think perhaps we can think about. Um, so, you know, whether or not remittances in relation to foreign aid promotes development rather than perpetuates inequalities, and then how we think about the scale of inequalities at the individual, familial, national, regional or global level, I think is a really important question to ask and has been undertaken. Um, it would be great to kind of analyze it in the context of the Gulf. I think also to about the issue about, um, you know, if the number of domestic workers in the region were to, to, to decline and what would be the broader social and cultural effects, um, again, there have been transformations in terms of increasing numbers. Decreasing numbers, not quite yet. So I think, again, this would be a really fruitful area of studies. And, and there, there it, it's not that it's um, unprecedented. So while I was conducting research in Kuwait, there were a number of um, younger Kuwaitis who expressed concern about the presence of, just to give a small example, uh, the concern about the presence of domestic workers in terms of they had been raised by women who they were very close to, and yet these very powerful forms of asymmetry and hierarchy existed between them growing up with these people who they were very close to, and they worried about the effects on their lives and then in turn on their children's lives. And so they were questioning whether or not it was necessary for them to have uh, the presence of the domestic workers in their home in the same way that their parents had. So again, you know, I think further studies about these really important issues are really necessary, and so it's great that there are centers like this and other higher education institutions in the region, uh, excuse me, in our city and in the region too. And in the region, yes, thank you, and in many regions, yes. I want to jump in on this one too, because I think, uh, Bailey, your question is, is very good, but we don't have empirical evidence so far that there are job losses in the, in the uh, domestic workers. It's not, not happening yet. What we do know is that there are layoffs in the construction industry. There are reports of uh, uh, contractors not paying employees in Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, we have seen job cuts across the public sector in Qatar in terms of the education sector in particular. Um, we have seen it in the oil and gas services sector across the region. Um, and this is often by, uh, these companies are not national companies, they're often uh, employed by the national oil companies. Um, so those are where, in terms of labor cuts, it's happening. Also in terms of white collar, um, we're seeing a, the, the real diminished presence of international banking uh, operations in the Gulf. Um, first they left Bahrain, they went to Dubai, now they're leaving Dubai. Um, so, you know, in terms of who's losing their jobs, it's actually people at the higher wage level right now. Um, and what will be the, the spinoff effects of that, we don't know yet, but something to, to study. I would also add that um, immigration policy or letting in foreign labor and administering that has always been a strategic priority of the Gulf states, and it has shifted in terms of the, the sending countries they have prioritized. Um, and the preference for Arab nationals um, diminished, and we saw again that tension after 2011 in the reissuance of visas. Um, so this is something that I think governments actually do have very good information on. They keep very close track on who's inside the country at any point and why they're there. 
Um, so it, there is that means to me the potential for governments to reform and to change um, because they they have good data and and good control over who comes in um, at any point. It's a question if the financial incentives were reduced because we know definitely citizenship in the Gulf is very much you know based on this question of of, of these privileges and. If those were to reduce, could we maybe see down the line a reconceptualization of citizenship? I'm not sure. I don't think necessarily. And the reason is, is that because we know that sort of idea of not wanting to expand the franchise to give, you know, because then your slice of the pie is going to get smaller. I definitely think that that's underpinning things on one level. But at the level of everyday popular discourse, when you talk to people in the Gulf, and I have a lot of you know, because I teach and I have a lot of these conversations with my students, so with young Kuwaitis, when you ask them about this question of citizenship and widening up, and or you know, what citizenship means, it's very much based on, Karen, you used the phrase earlier, these identity politics. What does it mean to be Kuwaiti beyond, or you know, whatever other nationality? And there's this growing, you know, because of the nature of the citizenship laws, we now have reached the stage where there is a concept of this, you know, that the Kuwaiti identity is somehow this pure, singular, monolithic concept that is at risk. And if we open up the franchise, then we are at risk of, as they, the phrase I always hear in Arabic is, you know, adat no taqalid now. Our customs and traditions are going to be diluted. And that, again, it goes to the question, the point I raised earlier is that the concept of citizenship, which is historically problematic. We don't have a monolithic concept, uh, identity, in anywhere in the Gulf. These were hybrid nations that have always been, you know, integrally connected within the Indian Ocean context and so on. But there, so that's part of the problem. Beyond, the, I think, the economic or the financial incentives that comes with the citizenship, wi with being a citizen. Um, and that's why I wonder, you know, how much the economic reform can, tr when it comes to that, the the, the, the the integration or the relationship between citizens and non-citizens there, I think the cultural and that social dynamic is fundamentally necessary to think about when we start to think about these labor reforms or opening up the franchise or even a changing the everyday rights and financial and otherwise of, of, uh, of non-citizens. Ahmad, I just wanted to jump in. I absolutely agree with you that taxing or putting a cap on remittances would be abhorrent. I was more thinking though, it Exactly, yeah. But when we think about like the group that Atiyah mentioned, which is the broader sort of middle class, non-citizen, second, third, fourth generation, it, you know, giving more inse financial incentives, things like not just to spend the money in, you know, in everyday life, but owning land, owning businesses, you know, knowing third generation families from India, from Egypt, and so on in Kuwait, if they were to able to own their land, own their businesses, and have that kind of a permanent presence. That was more in terms of where I was thinking in terms of you know making them feel like a, a, a fundamental part of, of the country and the economy.